Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who creates, redeems, and sustains us in all of creation. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Faithful God, have mercy on us. We confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We turn from your loving embrace and go our own ways. We pass judgment on one another before examining ourselves. We place our own needs before those of our neighbors. We keep your gift of salvation to ourselves. Make us humble, cast away our transgressions, and turn us again to life in you. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God hears the cries of all who call out in need. And through his death and resurrection, Christ has made us his own. Hear the truth that God proclaims. Your sins are forgiven in the name of Jesus Christ. Led by the Holy Spirit, live in freedom and newness to do God's work in the world. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O Lord God, merciful judge, you are the inexhaustible fountain of forgiveness. Replace our hearts of stone with hearts that love and adore you, that we may delight in doing your will through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. So last week we talked a little bit about how important it is to listen to our brothers and sisters in Christ, even when it might be hard or something we don't want to hear. This week we take the next step, and what happens after we are finished talking and listening to others who may have wronged us? Well, we call that word forgiveness. And in today's story, we learn a little bit about how God forgives us all the time. And it can take a lot to forgive so, like somebody. And I'm holding all these books here, and it's really hard to do this by myself. Um, but I'm trying, and it's hard. But just like forgiveness, it can be hard to take on something like that by ourselves. But when we know we have God with us, who has already forgiven us and loves us, we can kind of take a load off and rely a little bit on God. See, God is with us always and is always forgiving us, and in today's story we learn that he's forgiven us seven times seventy. Now, I'm sure some of you smart people can give an exact answer, but really what that means is he forgives us over and over and over again, and there's not a number, specific number to go along with that. So when we forgive each other, and we rely on God, and we love each other, and we have God on our sides, we can kind of take a little bit off, and it's easier to do sometimes. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for being with us always, especially as we continue to forgive each other. Amen. The first reading according to Genesis chapter 50. Realizing that their father was dead, Joseph's brother said, What if Joseph still bears a grudge against us and pays us back in full for all the wrong we did to him? So they approached Joseph, saying, Your father gave us this instruction before he died, saying to Joseph, I beg you, forgive the crime of your brothers and the wrong they did in harming you. Now therefore, please forgive the crime and the servants of God of your father of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also wept, fell down before him, and said, We are here as your slaves. But Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid. Am I in the place of God? 
even though you intend to do harm to me, God intended it for good, in order to preserve a numerous people as he is doing today. So have no fear. I myself will provide for you and your little ones. In this way, he reassured them, speaking kindly to them. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless God's holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all God's benefits. Who forgives all your sins and heals all. desires with good things, so that your youth is renewed like an eagle's. O Lord, you provide vindication and justice for all who are oppressed. You made known your ways to Moses and your works to the children. steadfast love for those who fear you. As far as the east is from the west, so far have you removed our transgressions from us. As the Father has compassion for his children, so you have compassion for those who fear you, O Lord. The second readings according to Romans chapter 14. Welcome those who are weak in faith, but not for the purpose of quarreling over opinions. Some believe in eating anything, while the weak eat only vegetables. Those who eat must not despise those who abstain, and those who abstain must not pass judgment on those who eat. For God has welcomed them. Who are you to pass judgment on, service, on servants of, a, of another? is before their own Lord that they stand or fall, and they will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make them stand. Some judge one day to better than another, while others judge all days to be alike. Let all be fully convinced in their own minds. Those who observe the day observe it in honor of the Lord, and those who eat, eat in honor of the Lord, since they give thanks to God, while those who abstain abstain and honor of the Lord and give thanks to God. We do not live to ourselves, and we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live in the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ died and lived again, so that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brothers and sisters? Or you, why do you despise your brother or sister? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall give praises to God. So then, each of us will be accountable to God.
The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 18th chapter. Peter came and said to Jesus, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, seventy-seven times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him ten thousand talents was brought to him. And as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold, there, together with his wife and children and all his possessions, and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of, the, of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves, who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, Pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my Heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace and peace to you from God the Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. Years ago, I remember calling up my father like I often did when we were both preaching on the same Sundays and asking him, how many times must I preach on forgiveness? As many as seven times? And following along with my little inside joke, he responded without missing a beat, no, my son, not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times. When I heard him say those words that I knew he was going to say, I laughed. But I also groaned a little bit. Because to be honest, I'm never very excited about preaching forgiveness. Not even now, years later. Last night, Pastor Lauren asked me what I was preaching on today, and when I told her, she had a very similar response. She said, wait, didn't you just preach on forgiveness? And I said, with probably way more sarcasm than was necessary, yeah, I did. But it's like forgiveness is absolutely core to our faith or something. I admittedly, want to move on from heavy stuff like forgiveness. I want to get to the fun, happy stuff and forget all about all the difficult work we are called to do as disciples of Christ. I know it's important and all that, but, well, it's not just hard to talk about. It's uncomfortable, especially forgiveness. In fact, I would say forgiveness is the hardest thing to talk about with others. It just drags up too many bad memories. And it's very, very uncomfortable. It causes a whole lot of awkward silence. This must be why the saying, forgive and forget, is so popular. I've heard that so often in my life, and it must be because we want to move on from the uncomfortable difficulty of forgiveness as fast as we can. And forget all those bad memories. Especially if someone brings up repentance, we really, really want to forget that part. But forgetting the sin almost always includes forgetting the forgiveness of that sin as well. Which means the repentance that led to the forgiveness is forgotten too. And seeking forgiveness from someone you've harmed without repentance is nothing but manipulation. Something Dietrich Bonhoeffer would call 
cheap grace. The parable Jesus shares with his disciples shows that forgiveness is absolutely necessary within the kingdom of heaven. Even worse than seeking cheap grace is receiving forgiveness, which we all have, and then refusing to share it with others. One of my professors in seminary explained that the debt the king forgave in this parable was more than 15 years wages. It was huge. And the debt owed the slave was tiny in comparison. Our sins, which God forgives, are far greater than any sin against us we refuse to forgive. We cannot live from God's mercy and forgiveness without extending that forgiveness to others. As followers of Christ, as disciples, we are called to remember the mercy we have been shown not in a mournful, guilty way that only encourages the temptation to forget, but in a joyful, outward way that brings release to the captive. So that as a certain seminary professor I know would say, through Christ we become not only forgiven sinners, but also forgiven forgivers. This is illustrated more clearly when we pray the Lord's Prayer and ask God to forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. As we forgive those who trespass against us. In that prayer, we remember the sinfulness within us and the drive to always want to repay evil with evil. But we also remember the mercy given to us in Christ Jesus and so are thus changed and moved to instead repay evil with good. Throughout the Gospels, the importance of forgiveness is emphasized over and over. Jesus brings it up again and again despite the topic's heaviness. Peter wants to be able to move on from it, to eventually say enough is enough, we got it. But Jesus won't let him. Jesus won't let any of us It is from the cross that Jesus grants forgiveness and promises us new life. And we are called to not forget the cross and move on from it in blissful ignorance, but to remember it, to never forget, and to allow ourselves to be made whole by it. To touch the marks of the nails in his hands and the wound in his side to take his body and blood given to us in communion and to do so for the remembrance of him. The remembering is the assurance we need of the grace and forgiveness that is given to us time and time again. It is the assurance that we are made new in Christ and those debts can no longer hold us captive. The only way to move on is to, in the words of the Lord's Prayer, remember those trespasses we ourselves have been forgiven of, and then to do the same to those who have trespassed against us. There is a famous story of an escaped prisoner of war who asked another POW if he had forgiven his captors yet. The second one answered the first, No, I will never do that. And the first responded, Then they still have you in prison don't they? Along that same line is another story from a rabbi named Harold Kushner. He tells of a woman in his congregation that would come to see him. She is a single mother, divorced, working to support herself and three young children. She says to him, since my husband walked out on us, every month is a struggle to pay our bills. I have to tell my kids we have no money to go to the movies while he's living it up with his new wife in another state. How can you tell me to forgive him? And Harold would answer her, I'm not asking you to forgive him because what he did was acceptable. It wasn't. It was mean and selfish. I'm asking you to forgive because he doesn't deserve the power to live in your head and turn you into a bitter, angry woman. 
I'd like to see him out of your life emotionally as completely as he is out of it physically. But you keep holding on to him. You're not hurting him by holding on to that resentment, but you're hurting yourself. When we refuse to forgive, we harden our hearts. We put on a tough exterior, a hard shell, and we refuse to let the pain out. Instead of letting go of the pain that has been caused us, we trap it inside, thinking we are defending ourselves from experiencing even more by growing hard and cutting off all feeling from the outside. But the truth is that sin will simply fester and rot us from within if we trap it in there with us. And that hardness of heart we think is protecting us from the pain is actually only keeping us from being healed. Forgiveness takes practice. It takes patience. It is not a one-and-done kind of event or holiday even that can be forgotten about all year, but then quickly remembered an hour or so before the service. For forgiveness to heal, to soften our hearts, to crack them open and make us whole, it must be remembered and take place in our hearts seven times, 77 times. This is why our Lord taught us to pray the words of the Lord's Prayer. And this is why we take communion whenever we can gather in His name. We do so in remembrance of Him. In remembrance of His grace, His forgiveness, His promise of the new life we have in His body and blood. As forgiven forgivers, we are saved. We are set free. We are healed. We are made new. Thanks be to God. Amen. United in Christ and bound together in His love, 
let us confess the faith of the whole church. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Drawn together in the compassion of God, we pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. O oh God, you welcome us when we are weak in faith. Uphold your church throughout the world. Make it a place of welcome. Strengthen faith through Bible studies and Sunday school, confirmation classes and youth ministries. Nurture new ministries of education and growth. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. The heights of the heavens show us the vastness of your steadfast love. Have compassion on your creation. Where human selfishness has brought ruin and destruction, we look to you to heal, renew, and redeem your world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Make your ways known to the nations. Speak kindness to our bitter grudges. Settle our hearts when we want to settle accounts with violence. Bless our leaders with patience and wisdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bring healing and justice wherever harm is dealt. Provide justice for all who are oppressed. Free victims of human trafficking and forced labor. Deliver all who are bound by debt. Feed all who hunger and guard refugees fleeing famine, poverty, and war. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bring healing and justice wherever harm is dealt. Provide justice for all who are oppressed. Free victims of human trafficking and forced labor. Deliver all who are bound by debt. Feed all who are hungry. And, and guard refugees fleeing famine, poverty, and war. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Teach us to forgive, even when we repeat ourselves. Remind us that you do not always accuse us. Still our tongues when we are tempted to pass judgment. Make this congregation a community of mercy for one another and for all our neighbors. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Tend to all in need of your compassion. Shelter all who are vulnerable in body, mind, or spirit, especially Terrence Wilson, Nancy Cross, Manuel Britton, Judy Baratini, the family and friends of Robbie Putnam, and all we name now, either out loud or silently in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Whether we live or whether we die, we are yours. We thank you for those who have showed us faithfulness. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All these things and whatever else you see that we need, we entrust to your mercy through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Choir, you may be seated. And congregation at home, the peace of Christ be with you always. Give me a moment as I prepare the elements for communion. I will keep the rest of the bread and the wine covered so that uh, only, only this cup and this bread, which I will partake from, um, will have, I guess, my germs floating over them. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. 
It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, broke it, gave thanks, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Come to the banquet following the service. Come to the banquet table where Christ gives himself as food and drink. We give you thanks, gracious God, that you have once again fed us with food beyond compare, the body and blood of Christ. Lead us from this place, nourished and forgiven, into your beloved vineyard to wipe away the tears of all who hunger and thirst, guided by the example of the same Jesus Christ and led by the Holy Spirit now and forever. God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you and lead you into the way of truth and life. Amen. Choir.
We good? Oh, good. Go in peace. Thank, remember the poor. Thanks be to God. Wait, did we get cut off there at the end? Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm good.